Hello and welcome back to the Phil Rosenberg Show. I am, of course, Phil Rosenberg. And I've got a very interesting uh, interview this evening. We're in a tense moment, yet another tense moment. Seems like uh, all, year, all year long, the year 2020 has been one tense moment after another. I want to thank you very much, though. Jonathan Corblo, uh, one of the, perhaps, has been on the most game shows in America, the American that has been on the most, or tied for, perhaps. In any event, a master of trivia, a master of chess, a master game player, who I have had the privilege of knowing for some time. I want to thank you very much for being here this evening and talking to me. Well, oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, my, my pleasure. So let me say, by the way, that you are currently working on a new game show called Masterminds. It airs every day on the Game Show Network, 4 p.m., and you can also catch that on Philo and Sling TV, which is kind of like a Hulu sort of setup, but uh, not yet as well known as Hulu, but getting much bigger. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it is a, a traditional game show, question and answer. I actually do it with the greatest of all time. His name is Ken Jennings, that you all know from Jeopardy fame. Uh, and he, I, and Muffy Morocco, we are uh, the masterminds, and then contestants come on, and if they can defeat us, then they win $10,000, and if they can do that three times, then they take one of our places as the masterminds, and it's a no fun so, show. Yeah. How many people have won $10,000 so far? Uh, I would say maybe six people have out of, uh, so far we've done something like 45 episodes, so we're at a pretty good clip. And one out of seven or something. Has anyone been replaced yet? No one has been replaced. No, no one has been lucky enough to win three times. Only one yeah, match. No. Only one person has won twice. One person has won twice. Okay, quite interesting. I love the premise of the game. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me shift gears from something that I'm quite happy for you about to something that's difficult to discuss. And I just I've been doing these interviews with people that I know and who I know are thoughtful folks. And uh, we're talking about George Floyd, and I, I almost, you know, sometimes I have no words. So on May 25th, George Floyd is killed by four police officers, and uh, they've now been charged with various crimes. And there are there is civil unrest. I think is the only way to put it. The president of the United States has threatened to call in the military. The military leaders today and over the last 48 hours have made it quite clear that they don't think the United States military should be uh, used against American citizenry. And we've got several, we've got, I think it's five or six active duty military leaders saying roughly the same thing. And then a bunch of retired military folk as well. So, uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating if I say this shit is hitting the fan, you know. Certainly is. Yeah. yeah it's, it's very, very tense out there for a lot of Americans. Um, I was looking at a Twitter analytic uh, website that was talking about the, uh, the collective happiness index of all the tweets. And I mean, I don't know if this is a great uh, signifier of anything, but it reached its very lowest point, its nadir. Uh, just yesterday, where like the collective of all of the tweets together are at their saddest point. And like, you know, it talks about the happiest points being sort of, uh, you know, Obama's elected or Christmas Day or, you know, uh, the Duke and uh, Duchess Meghan get married and all the people are like full of positivity. So yeah, the, the social media, the television, the uh, on the streets, the collective unconscious, it's, it's a, and it's not just the United States, you know, this is a, a worldwide phenomenon of the oppressed, the attacked, the uh, minorities, the poor and those in poverty feeling fed up. And, you know, the, the, outbreak of riots i mean it's it's so easy to be like uh you know de blasio stinks or man cuomo if it wasn't for cuomo and trump you know i mean like yes there are very many uh critiques that can be made on each local level but a, a part of 
the human experience is our own myopia. And you look in a very big way, you see the rioting and, and, and protesting in London, in Paris, in Greece. And like, you know, the, the beginning of 2020 and 2019, Hong Kong for democracy. So uh, yeah, these, these things are huge, but just to bring it back down to the, the point at hand, the catalyst of these latest, uh, you know, protests and uh, civil unrest is George Floyd. But, you know, I believe the larger uh, explanation is, I mean, we're all coming out of this COVID quarantine and the buildup of a lot of potential energy, almost like a spring being pulled at this point, you know, you have people just feeling like government is mismanaging things. Let's say, let's say, let's say, I, I want to agree with you. So let's change that statement slightly. Let's say it's due to both things together are, so I agree with you. There's this restless energy that people have. And this has been an ignition point. This event has been an ignition point, not just for African Americans and not just for allies of African Americans or people of color, but for white supremacists as well. So, and you know, people on the other side of this discussion, it's a moment in time that, uh, you know, it's worrisome. Let's be honest, it's a little bit worrisome. I, I have friends that want to see the system pulled down. I have friends that want to prop it up. I have friends that want to change it from the inside. I have, not all the opinions are, you know, I have one friend in particular who I used to do a radio show with, my dear friend, Mike, who, he just wants chaos. It's like, dude, really? That's what you want? Chaos? You don't, you don't want to, you know, you just don't want to have a successful government. So, I mean, I'm just saying that I mix with every stripe of, of ideology and happily, I, I'm curious about it all, but I am, I've never been worried about democracy in the United States as I am now. And by the way, despite being a Bernie Sanders supporter, I do not blame Trump for where we are well, all right, saying you don't blame Trump is important because I understand your level of nuance. And a lot of people will say that Trump has instigated and has- uh, He's exacerbated, exacerbated. He's exa exacerbated. But, but the thing is, what he's but done- he's not is, the cause. He's not the cause, exactly. And this is the big problem and I agree. So this is great because I'm begging people to continue to ask how we got Trump, why we got Trump. It's not an accident. And until we answer those questions, we're going to keep having this pendulum swing back and forth. And Trump is going to seem like a dream. In the same, everyone, remember how we, how people on the left, they despised George Bush, thought, my God, thank God for Obama. Uh, you know, by comparison, Obama was, was godlike, right? I, and, and we thought nothing could be worse than George Bush. And now George Bush seems like heaven sent by comparison. And we're going to keep on being in that situation cycle after cycle, unless we figure out why it's happening now. What is it that brings Trump here to us? So let me ask you that question as my first question to you. Why do you think, we're going to talk about George Floyd, but I want to ask you first how we got to this moment, right? Because it's not just, George Floyd is, a, is, is a, it's so sad for him and his family but he's one event in many. He's a, he's a data point from, if we take the macro view, I, I don't want to depersonalize or minimize what's happened to him, but the larger view about racism in this country is he is a part of that story. He's not the whole story is what I mean. So I want to ask you- so How did we get to this point? Um, yeah. First of all, I mean, to kind of paraphrase George Carlin, we deserve all of our elected officials. Uh, we hope for the best and brightest of our citizenry to run for office, for mayor, governor, senator, president. And when we have the choices in front of us, we ourselves, the electors, pick one of them. So literally, like, obviously, there's, that's a very kind of specious argument in some ways, because there's gerrymandering, there is redlining, there is a lot of uh, things that happen that devalue the urban and the ethnic vote for certain. But by and large, 
we are in this mess because this is a mess of our own creation. Um, I wish there was no Mitch McConnell and there was no Lindsey Graham and all of the people who prop up Trump. But, you know, the, the reaction- The question is, how do we get Trump? So let's take a step back from Trump just for a sec. Let's, there's lots to say about him, easy. I want to say, I want to ask, how did we get a Donald Trump? Why do we have Donald Trump here? What is it that, that because it's not 10 people that voted for him and it's not 10 people that still love him, right? We live in a country with 360 some odd million people and a lot of those people love Donald Trump. How, okay, well, did, we, how did we get here? Well, then I'm going to get even more philosophical than, than George Carlin because okay. it is a truth that we see, you and I see, of, you know, the, uh, what we observe in the world. And there are people who have a, a different and skewed viewpoint where the truth, the, the same words and the same actions are interpreted extremely differently. And why are they interpreted differently? Because their worldview uh, takes in the same stimulus and interprets it differently. The, the, the truths mm. of what they see is completely changed. It's almost like sometimes we see those um, optical illusions where if you look at it one way, it's a duck. And you look at it another way, it's you know uh, something like a frog or a bird or a woman, or like it's an old lady or it's a, it's a young lady. You know, I, I see the dress as being black and, and, and gold and you see it as being white and blue. There are things in our brains that are both natured and nurtured that make us interpret stimuli differently. And if I, as a child, grew up with, you know, uh, a football coach as a dad, and he told me about law and order, and like, you know, every single day when we watched the news, he was like, ah, you know, those thugs, like these tiny little micro bits of input will shape my worldview. And conversely, uh, if I grew up under a different circumstance with a, a preacher as a father and, you know, he, uh, you know, did some charity every day, then I might look at, let's say, people in poverty differently. Maybe the former guy's father would say, oh, you know, he deserves what he got. He wasn't working hard enough. And then the preacher's father might be like, oh, you know, the, he's downtrodden. It, it so, all boils down to individual circumstance. But I, I want to... But those, but those, but those are metastasized in groupthink, right? Like, if I feel like, you know, I look at Trump and one of the biggest discerning factors of Trump early on was there are people who take him seriously, but not literally. And there are people who take him literally, but not seriously. That was the uh, genesis of, you know, how it got there. And obviously, you know, we can talk about Roger Ailes and Fox News and, and the bubbles that we operate in. But for the most part, there are so many people who see when Trump is asked a question, he's just like, Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, hey, that's the kind of way I would react, you know? And they see the way Obama is asked a question and he's measured and calculated and he wants to be tactful. And they see that as some kind of deception because he's not really speaking from his gut and his heart. And regardless of the fact that they're they saying both he's like, contrived, they're saying he's contrived, despite the fact that he's at one of the best orators that I've ever seen in American politics, that's for sure. Right. But, but I, I get what they're saying. He's, not, he's, he's not, not saying polished. it extemporaneously. He's, he's not, not saying it in a polished way. They mistrust that because they are not politicians. So Trump comes on the scene. And I mean, there's just, he, he's a middle domino. A thousand dominoes fell down. We've already had these, these two different countries in a lot of ways. And the reason you that Obama was the word, You have to say the phrase politically correct, though, because this plays a part in the conversation about how Trump communicates versus how other politicians do. And a lot of his followers like the fact that Trump clearly, I, I mean, I'm not gonna say that he's not able, I don't really know, but he does not appear to be able to be politically correct or certainly is not interested in it. And that uh, comes across as truthful by comparison to other politicians. That I think is a big thing. And he's perceived as, has been perceived as a, you know, Washington outsider. He ran against how many? How many were in the primary? Another twelve or thirteen? Twelve or thirteen people yeah. that he, you know, Jeb Bush and 
Sure. So many people, he, he was able to defeat Ben Carson, all of those guys. He trounced them all. So being an outsider perhaps is a, a part of it. But let me let me give it back to you. I don't want to. Sh- I don't need to share all my ideas here. Actually, I would like to know. I would like By to. Know- large, I guess the I, I would want to get more into the race aspect because That's what I'm about to ask you actually the the, the aspect of um, Trump and Trumpianism could have gone in a different direction, but because he likes to take advantage of you know the sort of the the tenor of the division and and the people who you know the rednecks or whomever in the middle of the country who are you know going to his rallies there's a lot of uh there's a lot of racial anima that he knows that he can take advantage of it's it's almost like any wall street investor you know they don't really always care about the company they're just looking to profit you know they'll they'll go in destroy a company leave it in shatters because they know that it, for these margins they can make something that's and you're saying that's reason. how trump feels about republican ideology he's just that's the convenient part of him to be and i agree i mean he supported democrats for most of his life here in new york for the obvious reasons that was the, the system in control here in new york I 100% agree with you. I would like to talk a little bit about race, John. Let me ask you a question about, about race. There's something about the African-American experience in this country that differentiates them from every other group that lives here. Uh, and that is, of course, that... So pri- there's basically three groups of people that live in this country right now. People that lived here before the Europeans arrived. Europeans that arrived from that moment onwards as immigrants, meaning they chose to come here, they, they chose to come here, they wanted to build a new life for themselves, they were all the things that immigrants are, and slaves who were brought here against their will, and who, you know, all the horror stories that go with that. So, I have been asking myself, what is the difference? Does that make any difference? The fact that African American, the fact that African Americans are never said, I want to be in America, I want to be an American at the inception of their arrival point, right? That's not a part of their past on history all the way down the line. Does that have an effect, do you think, on either how African Americans perceive society, how society perceives African Americans? Do you think that that is, that that has, that that's any part of the racial, racism question? Uh, is it is it not really important? It's so long ago that it's no longer relevant, and it's it's just why am I even asking this question? What do you, what do you think about that? Well, that's another very thoughtful question. I would I would say that uh, you know the first slaves were brought to this country aboard a ship in 1619, right? Our our great currently failed experiment did not officially begin until 1776. So even before our country was a country. There were there were Africans on this land tilling the soil and picking cotton and whatnot. Um, and like you know, we have our history of European immigrants. And now you know, immigrants also from Asia, South America, and Africa. To be honest, and and the interweaving and mixing of you know people. You know, Phil, you yourself could have the descendants of of African slaves in you, or slave owners the 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 mix at this point is almost ultra relevant I do dance, I, 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 you know something i i go back three generations in this country so i personally trace my family's history to russia and i pr- so probably not although Sure, uh, but, uh, I wouldn't be. I would. I would be. I get. I get your point, though. In other words, yeah, the, the approach. And all right, I'll, I'll. I'll even make a further point to sort of add on to that. My last name is Korbla. Um, Korbla is or German. Maybe it's actually Ga. It is. Uh, it's what uh, from Ghana. My okay. dad was born in Ghana, and Korbla uh, is a Guyanese name, but so French then. French no, no. Ghana. The country of Ghana. Oh no, Guyana, I'm thinking. So Ghana. No, no, yeah, yeah. No, G H A N A. It's in West Africa. Okay. So my father is Ga, and like all the last names in Ghana are days of the week. So my last name means Tuesday. And I know my heritage of Ga. And my mother's Jamaican. 
Kerbala means Tuesday. Yeah. In, in which language? In Da. The language is called Da. da. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm just. Like, if, have you ever heard the name Kofi before? Kofi Annan. That means Friday. Have you ever heard the name Kwame before? I, of course I have. Yes, indeed. Kwame means Saturday. Kojo is Monday. Kunta is Wednesday. Kobla is uh, Tuesday. All, a lot of West African names between Yoruba, Ewe, Ga, Twi, a lot of these names share the same convention, which is days of the week. That's neither here nor there. The point is, there are Africans who've been I coming to this. Dutch, for sure. I thought you were, because Kerbala looks Dutch, also the way it's spelled in particular. Sorry. Sometimes they call me the flying Dutch, but sometimes, you know, I, if, if, if I turn a certain way, people are like, is that Rick Smith? <laughs> is, is that Heidi Klum? Anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm just saying that, like, you know, our first African American president was also half white. Like the to to just take, and this is an interesting question when it comes to reparations, right? The questions of slavery and the damage, the trauma, and the lasting effects have been debated by you know James Baldwin and and uh, you know so many great thinkers and philosophers and and people who are trying to fix these issues. And it is immensely complex. And the fact that my heritage is an immigrant heritage does not negate the black experience for me in the United States of America. And you know the effects of how hard it would be to get a loan and the effects of the violence of policing. And the, I don't know if that does make me entitled to slavery reparations it's 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 it doesn't seem as though it would but at the same time what about a white person who has when did your a, family a great, when did your family emigrate to the united states in the early 1970s got you interesting and do you think that you know this is very interesting so do you think because uh there are a lot of statistics about african immigrants and their position in american society and how that differs from oh, yeah i mean like college graduation rates are much higher among african immigrants than african americans there's so many different things and like there's so much racism how do you account that for that though this is the big this is what my question before was about because if you if there's a big difference and between the result of an african immigrant in this country it, the result that they have trying to integrate and and succeed from that person or that family to a family that was brought here as a slave. And, and physically, people are looking roughly the same, right? So like a, a policeman can look at you and see this guy, this is a black guy. If he doesn't like black people, you're gonna be harassed just as well as someone who's been, whose family has been here for 20 generations or more, right? So it's not that that makes the difference. What does make the difference? What is what accounts for the difference between the African immigrant experience in this country and the person who's has comes from a long a long line of slaves or were at one time slaves? What do you think? You know Chris Max, don't you? I sure do. Yeah, yeah. Maximovich. Yeah. So Chris yeah. is obsessed with George Orwell, and he's obsessed with uh, history. And there's this one quote from George Orwell that goes, "He who controls the past." controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. And throughout past, like Western civilization history, the, you know, lighter and less melanated, complected peoples, the British Empire, the French Empire, that dominated, pillaged the African country, the, the, the entire North America and South America, and you know, even to uh, Raj, you know, era India and China with the tea. There's a lot of history that goes into how we have gotten to this place right now. And we can rewrite history, you know, and it currently is always rewritten. You see history books that say things like, oh, you know, the slaves, some of them were very well treated by their owners. And, uh, you know, some slaves chose to come here and so many things. That is how the present is, the, the people in power in the present are able to control the past. If, if Hitler had won, let's say, if, if you know, the, the Nazis had won, you know, we wouldn't have, uh, you know, 
A, so much of what we have in the world, but B, we wouldn't have, have the Phil Rosenberg show, that's for sure. We wouldn't have the Phil Rosenberg show. We wouldn't have, you know, the ability to have this site of Judaism and, and Israel that we have right now, and, and so many things. It's it's, and they 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 would have been able to control the past and demonize Jews till this day. So but you're saying I have happen. a misperception about what the African American experience is like in this country? Is that what you're getting we, to? We all have a misperception. I too have a misperception of the African American experience. But um, there's data that that shows clearly that African immigrants have a greater rate of success than yes. African Americans. So I'm asking, how do you account for that data? What is it about? Something there must be a reason for it, right? Or is okay. it just coincidence? I mean, what? As, as I am not a sociologist or a demographer, I'm only going to give you personal anecdotes. That's what so I mean. I'll go there. Um, yeah. My father, when I was young, would, you know, sort of walk me down the street and I would be like, you know, dad, why did that kid call me an African booty scratcher? See, the first racism I felt was from other Black people. Um, within the Black community, there's colorism. You know, there are people who say like, oh, light skins are soft and oh, dark skins do this. And uh, there is an immense, unstoppable wave of racism that will never end. And until we all look exactly alike, alike, racism won't end in that way. The human ability to notice and dwell on differences is unstoppable. Even if we all look exactly like you, Phil, but one person has like a little space in his eyebrow you know, on Star Trek, you remember the, on Star Trek where they had the guys who were half right. black on one side and half white on one side and Kirk didn't know what was wrong with them? Yeah. Dr. Seuss with the star belly sneeches, like these allegories, these, these fables, they, they haven't hit us because we are obsessed with the differences, right? But to account for the difference, I'll tell you, my father would say, oh, you know, these uh, African-Americans have been in this country forever and haven't been able to make anything of themselves. And I'd be like, like, okay, I guess that's an explanation from my father, my father from Africa. And this is not something that is singular to my dad. You know, this comedian Godfrey would say the same thing. You know, the, a lot of Africans, especially African immigrants in this country, their parents do sometimes almost a disservice by trying to separate them from the African-American experience. And unfortunately, it is inevitable that the longer we are in this country, our experiences will overlap. And the one difference is the the immigrants push. And this is not just African immigrants, it's Asian immigrants and immigrants across the board to see within this country its great potential for upward mobility, the, the American dream that has been sold and transmitted around the world. So there is that work you're, you're ethic. You're getting closer to my thoughts here, right? I'm still sort of waiting for the, so are you saying, let me try and boil it down. So tell me if I missed what you're saying here. Are you saying that the spirit of the immigrant, the courageous person who leaves their home, picks up everything and goes or somewhere around the world, in this case to the United States, is a quality that serves you well versus Versus what exactly, I guess? This is really what I'm well, asking. Well, it's, it's twofold. It's not just the parents who instill in their children the immigrant experience. You know, whether you're from Bangladesh and you come to live in New Jersey and your father tells you, like, how he had one freaking shirt and, like, you better make something of yourself because I did everything I could to be in this country. That is an impression of guilt upon that first-generation child to eventually make it to Princeton. And then conversely, it's like it goes both ways. Like, you know, your parents are constantly telling you how lucky you have it in this life. It's a imprinting of a certain optimism because without a doubt, the immigrant optimism is what put them on the path to come to this country. Whereas there is a pessimism that is deep within the African-American experience and rightly so because of trauma because of experience because of literal because not only seeing like george floyd right let, let him be the metaphor for the african-american experience i think that's a yeah. fair way to, to catch it I understand I mean, like, yeah. 
but I could also be George Floyd, you see? Like, there's nothing about me, like, for instance, you, you wouldn't have said, oh, Jonathan's different. He's like, his, his dad is from Ghana. You never would think that unless I told you. And the same for Obama and the same for so many others that are in this country, John Boyega and, and what have you. But I don't want to continue harping on the difference because you and I have more in common, for instance, than I would have with, let's say, an African immigrant who lives in Minnesota, who is Somali or something like that, who has just a different, like, we can always say, yes, intellectuals can find more common ground than you with some protester or some uh, person in jail. Like that, it's just, there are a lot of things that we constantly do that are deleterious to our solutions, to our, because we all are hoping to but, not let another George Floyd happen. And so you said, you're saying solutions. Let me, let me draw us, let me draw some direction here. Uh, George Floyd represents a problem that is endemic in this country, has been since I would say the beginning of, of European uh, efforts in this country. So I want to know, I asked this to someone I interviewed recently, and I didn't get a thorough enough answer. I would like to give you a chance to answer these two questions. First, if we could imagine ourselves a successful change in American society that would make the George Floyds of the United States disappear, or just be coincidence, have nothing to do with skin color, maybe just a bad cop being bad. What what is that? What does that look, actually look like for you? What does success and change look like for you? And then I want to ask you to be sort of a chess player about it, right? Chess players think that here's my objective. Now let's devise a plan how to get there, right? So I want to ask you both of those questions. First, what does success look like? Second, how do we get there? That's a great question. Um, success in so far as George Floyd, I believe, requires a fundamental rethinking of what policing in this country is. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen without a fundamental rethinking in terms of the distribution of wealth and power in this country. I believe a lot of policing, especially extremely uh, violent policing, comes from our kind of descent into fascistic uh, government. Uh, so I would like to start with defunding and demilitarizing a lot of police departments. I would like to, uh, if you look at... So you're talking LA, about, sorry, you're talking about how do we get to success, but I'm asking you first, what is success? Like, what is that? I'm reverse engineering it. I'm sorry for, for pulling you out of this response here, but I want to know, like, first, what are we aiming at? And then how do we get there? You know? Um, I'll start with a statistic there. Um, because I do like to start with statistics. The amount per capita of Americans that are killed by police in this country is uh, about 800 times that of the nearest country. And almost every single country in the top 30 has a rate that is something like, you know, per million people, it's something like two people are killed or 20 and 31 or something like that. And then you look at the United States, it's like a thousand and five people. Um, Finland, Japan, over the past 15 years, have killed no people. And we constantly beat this drum of how America is exceptional, how we are the greatest country on earth. And we have nothing but statistics to disprove that. So if I would say what does success look like? I would say if we are an unremarkable statistical blip among other countries, as far as death by police goes, there is no reason for United States to not only lead, but lead far and away more than any country. And for us to have a, a rate of murder by police that is hundreds of times more than the second most country is appalling. For us to have a rate of coronavirus that is hundreds of times more than other countries is appalling. Healthcare, hundreds of times worse than other countries, appalling. So well, there's- Some of that is perhaps debatable. Eh, you're yeah. right, because it depends on what the criteria you're using to measure, but, but go on. 
of course, but I mean, there's there's a lot of data that supports the failures of the American government and system in a lot of ways. Now, that being said, my earlier point was still in other countries around the world, there are protests and they do not have the same amount of police brutality or murders by cop that we have in the United States, but they're still protesting, which means the hand of, of racism is still strong in countries around the world. But in this country, for us to at least ameliorate our legacy of, of death and, and turmoil and, and protest and uh, outrage, we would need to curtail that. And I believe defunding and demilitarizing police is a part of the steps there. That's how um, yeah. You know, changing our weaponry, changing our training. Uh, I believe personally that the amount of training that goes into becoming a police officer is it's, it's ludicrous. It's something between, uh, I think, like 80 and 100 hours of police academy that you do before you're just given a badge and a gun. It's, it's, it's insane. To be here's, a a radical, here's a radical idea. Right? Uh, in England, only a very small minority of policemen or of police people, as the case may be, have guns. The public does not have guns, except an incredibly small amount, like only the worst baddies, you know, only the worst villains. Have, There's a reason have we have a lot of guns in the police officers. And why do we have a lot of guns in the police officers in this country? Because our citizenry is armed to the teeth. That's right. So this is, this is the point I'm going to make, that, that some portion of this perhaps connects to the Second Amendment, right? Perhaps one some way. Some portion connects? That's a very passive voice, Phil. That is, there's a, a well, there's more to it, right? Because that doesn't account for access to guns does not account for racism, the thing that is driving the violence, right? The ability to commit the violence is what is what is driven by the Second Amendment, but not the desire to commit the violence, I would say, right? So there's there are two separate things. They're related. There's crossover, but they're not the same, I would argue. And so I don't speak of them in the same terms. And I also, you know, my job as an interviewer is to sort of uh you know talk about things in a way that it's relatable right so not everything i i don't go for modern day journalism is about sensationalism say the most outrageous thing right i want things to be understood clearly i'm here to provide information and maybe to do sure yeah um so in response to the black panther party in the 1960s uh, you know, Huey Newton and uh, Eldridge Cleaver, they, they tried to show force and strength in our cities against our police officers. And the way they did that was they said, Black people must be holding weapons. And if we are, then they, we will be treated differently. And J. Edgar Hoover st started COINTELPRO, and this was to basically destroy the Black Panther Party. And, and what arose from that is our modern National Rifle Association. Literally the power of the NRA came and the genesis of that came from racism. And, and the, the rapid, insane, hyperbolic rise of gun ownership and gun rights and the lobbying of the NRA basically originated there. The, the racism is the birth defect of our country. And there, there are so many things that we cannot extricably change because they, racism is, is interwoven in the DNA of our country. Do you say racism cannot be undone in this country? Cannot be I don't say racism cannot be undone in the world. Yeah. But now let's become philosophical about it. Because so where, you know, have, where you have a homogenous society, there's not much racism at the local level, right? They might hate, they might, they have to find places to experience the other, right? If you have a homogenous society. So are you well, suggesting that, the, that we're particularly susceptible to racism? Yes. Because there are so many others here, right? We're a nation of immigrants. And, uh, and also the power structure is embedded with the racism as well. That, you know, within our constitution we were three-fifths of people and uh you know there are 
you know, only for the purpose of votes. That's a mis. That's a little bit of a misnomer. The the chattel slave owner was able to express that vote themselves. It was not that an African American was able to go to the poll and like you get five yeah. African Americans equal three votes. That's not that's not what it was. It was the owner of the slave that was able to uh, participate in an ever greater way if they had more slaves, right? In in the electoral I, system, right? I believe to be really academic about it, we have to sort of talk about a how we think and talk about racism first yeah. and then how we distinguish between types of racism so uh, especially among sociologists and the black community lately a big and very popular sentiment is that black people cannot be racist and that is because the racism means the the levers of power are controlled in such a way that systemic racism, which is a kind of racism that we are almost using a metonymy of, where we talk about all racism as systemic racism. And that is not the case. There is systemic racism and there's individual racism. There is uh, societal racism and societal ethics and individual ethics. So let's just get first to the society and to the structure and the system. The, the structure and system of racism can be fixed. Absolutely. I, I, you must believe that or else none of us would be marching on the streets. The individual racism, the, the individual ethic of looking at another person and having this deep guttural feeling like there is something detestable about them and I don't like them, that cannot be fixed. Now, all humans are the people who make laws and you know we, we have to be able to almost separate those two things and that's extremely difficult and those are the things that i'm thinking about which is My you know i can i can be racist i can be racist toward you if i have a certain power over you as i told you other black people can be racist toward me other black people can be racist toward other black people okay. there are people there are asians and, and and indians and hispanic people who are racist against other indians and asians and hispanic people i can tell you how many times there are people who climb the ladder of success, who make it in spite of adversity. And what do they do? They pull the ladder up behind them. And instead of sharing the love with their fellow compatriots, the, the people who they see are struggling, they say to themselves, oh, I made it even through all this. Why shouldn't you? So, good, good. Let me, interject, let me interject something because I often have asked myself, and you're really addressing this, or what is it about Jewish people in this country that sets them apart? One of the things, there's more than one thing, one of the things that does is that we don't pull up the ladder behind us when we're successful. We bring, we go back into the synagogue, bring our friends and family along, help them. Uh, and that is an absolutely critical, so that comes from being oppressed, right? We become a very insular group and um, now in this country, especially after gentrification in New York, the Hasids, for example, have a ton of money, right? Because when you, you own Williamsburg, but it was in the 80s, you didn't own much, right? Or the same thing with Borough Park, now a totally different story. But they are bringing other Jews with them into that success. And maybe not every group does that. And I, I wonder why not? Can you address why, you know, why not is the big question. It seems to me like the natural thing to do but I am Jewish, so that's what I learned. Yeah, uh, I mean, again, this is a, a, a ethnographic question that is difficult because I wanna go into some stereotypes with you and, and certain uh, observed truths and stereotypes that a lot of people believe, but there, I don't want to get into this slippery slope of like, oh, you know, all the Jews do this and the blacks do this and all this stuff, because I feel like that almost uh, will erode my own argument uh because at the end of the day i'm very very nuanced about my understanding of people but to to answer your question yes there are george uh, i'm sorry donald trump said i don't want black people counting my money I, I they're inherently lazy i want those guys with yarmulkes counting my money so like this is our president of the United States, and he's like on record saying these things. And this is not just presidents, but it's CEOs and athletes and what have you. Like we all have these stereotypes and they're, they're pervasive because 
in a lot of ways, we know certain things to be true. We can't deny what we have observed and seen with our own eyes, that, that the, the Jewish community, Malcolm X said it himself, the Jewish community will reinvest in themselves. And, you know, my Jewish friends, when we're joking around and we're sitting like laughing about something, we're like, you know, I'm a Jew, I'm very good with money. And like, he's joking that way because his uncle joked that way. And his uncle joked that way because his grandfather joked that way. And, you know, it's like, it is a both prideful truth and a shameful truth to, uh, to admit the stereotypes that you know outwardly people are saying about you, but that doesn't well, make them it, less true. It's, it's how African-Americans can use the N-word, the, the exact same dynamic, how Jews sure. can be like, we're cheap. Yeah, we're cheap, or we have, you know, incredibly big this or small that, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right, but it, but that also is a way to enamor and and uh, you know engender yourself to your own community. To accept our traits is to become a, like you, no one. Let's ask that question, John. Let's. I would like to ask that question as long as we're sort of walking around that 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 tree. Uh, one thing that I really admire about the LGBT. QA community is that they took the insults, faggot, homo, queer, and they took them. <laughs> no, but no, they, they took them. Well, I can say these things because they're no longer insults. This is the thing that I'm saying that they've done so well. Like, uh, like I have friends who are gay. I mean, okay, yes, if I say those words with vitriol, it means something different than if I'm just clinical no. about it or from joking See, around. Now you're talking. You see, the word Jew. It can be both the epithet and the descriptor of a person. Okay. Thank right. you, Louis C.K., right? That's a little... Exactly, a, exactly. Yeah, that's right. yeah. So, so yeah, so so given this, that's that's true. I admire, I'm saying, the LGBTQ community for doing, for doing that. I wonder why, I don't think that that's happened completely in the African-American community, but it has happened to some degree. And what I mean by that is that I cannot... Other than, unless I'm prepared to be really politically incorrect to the point where people are going to be like, that dude is such a huge jerk. I cannot say the N-word, really. Uh, I But black people can, right? So I'm not complaining about this. I'm just observing it. And I'm saying, I'm sort of asking why, you know, why in the LGBT community, it seems to be like universally now, okay, right? That language is like not harmful anymore but that hasn't yet happened in the African-American community or have I misunderstood, maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the dynamic a little bit, right? Lang language is um, in the pyramid of, of racism and, and the pyramid of sexism and the pyramid of homophobia. If we look at it, the, the language that we use kind of feeds up towards our thinking. There's this thing called the, uh, uh, I think it's like the Sapper-Worth hypothesis, like the language we use influences our thoughts and our actions. So if we're constantly using these uh, terms, then that will put us into uh, a mind space of accepting certain actions and feelings. So there are a lot of people who preach that we must abstain for certain words just so that we can, you know, start on our path towards something. And at the same way, you know, vegans talk about like uh, the uh, ethical reasons for not eating meat, you know, and, and yet, you know, there's all kind. Of, there's just this huge fracture of our opinions. I can't really speak on the, the queer experience in that way. I've been to many pride marches. I know there's a lot of people who, you know, are very insistent upon using the correct pronoun, for instance. You know, you call me as a they or a them rather than he or she or her or what have you. However, if you are, you know, in a more intimate setting, those pronouns can go out the window. The same way, you know, like instead of being like, call me they, you know, a couple of gay guys will be like, hey girl, or something like that, because there is the trust within that community and the mistrust of outsiders, right? The same way that, like, you know, a lot of Black people, when they're talking with each other, there's, you know, it's, it's liberal, it's free in terms of how we're speaking. As soon as a white person comes into that room, it can change things up, the dynamic itself. How does it um, change? Oh, you're telling me, oh, stop right there, Let's capture that moment. White guy walks into the room, what is it exactly that changes? Because, by the way, it happens the other way too, right? A bunch of white guys in a room. My experience is the other side of this, right? A bunch of white guys in a room, Black guy walks in the room. 
things do change. I agree. I want to ask you, what is it that's, what is the essence of that, that has changed? Something, what is it that has happened? I mean, these are just conversational mores and tropes. Like we, we have a, a shared secret and the shared secret is what pulls us together. And I don't know if you have that same shared secret because our complexion is different. And I don't know if you have, I can look at another black man on the street and I can say he could be George Floyd. And we can have the immediate understanding that we might suffer the same adversities. You might look at another guy who has a yarmulke and say like, you know what, those guys who shot up the Tree of Life synagogue are bastards. And you know, we have to be hyper vigilant about them. And I might not even, you know, it might not even register to me or something about, you know, the freaking matzo brie, how it's so delicious or something like that. You know, I don't know. Like there's something that we have shared experiences, shared dialogue, and shared history that allows the conversation to be different. And you know, HG but, Wells, but notice the difference though between the LGBT community reclaiming claiming those insults making them all but basically disarming those insults not a hundred percent right because you can still be nasty and use those words um in a hurtful way but i think by and large at least in terms of ordinary usage they're out there and it's okay right as long as you're so i, I wonder what is the difference and by the way same thing in the jewish community you cannot i can say kike because i'm jewish if you say it, it's a different thing right it's, it, it is, it's right, it's a different thing. Same thing with the N-word. I have to say the N-word, you don't have to say it. I'm just sort of wondering about the psychology behind that and, and how well, is it I mean, better to get to, isn't it better to get to- There's, the there's, there's a lot of Jewish people who would not like to hear you say that. And there's a lot of black people who would not like to hear me say the N-word. And there are a lot of gay people who would not like to hear the, hear the uh, F-word. Um, I would say that we have varying levels of sensitivities. And I, I, I don't know if I'm able to speak. Like Candace Owens the other day came out and she was like, you know, black Republicans this, and black conservatives that, and we should not this and so on and so forth. And, you know, she has this way of making racists feel better about themselves. She has this way of yeah. like saying, oh, see, look, there's one and she's saying what I feel deep in my heart, so I must not be so bad. And, you know, hearing it's funny Someone, that you mentioned her. I just was just was watching her and Cornell West uh, have a discussion on Fox News, and it's just what you're describing. But, but sorry, yeah. to interject. I mean, and I personally will fall way more into the Cornell West circle of thinkers than in the Candace Owens. Um, but you know, it's a it's a damn shame because you know she doesn't realize that a she is being racist and the fact that she is black does not stop her from benefiting from the levers of power that white people give her to use against other black people. Like literally all of her efforts racistically are to, to push down a movement and a, uh, a way to stop the effect of change. So she is being used and, and gaining her power through that. But regardless, it's this thing where, A, how can any of us speak for all of us? That's why I'm saying within the the realm of systemic racism, we always will, like white people will always want to say the N word and straight people will want to say epithets against gays. And, you know, they, there's this- It's not against though, it's not against. This is, that's the thing that I'm saying here. When you disarm an insult like that, it's no longer, you can then use it in a way that is not against. It's just an ordinary descriptor. I can't look, I mean, I can't do it all the time. I have a feeling I'm going to, I'm going to catch a little hell for my language, actually. Now that you've made me think about it, I may very well, because it's true. Not every uh, gay person is okay with the F word and not every white, uh, not every Jewish person is okay with the K word and so on. But so you did acknowledge something, Phil. You know what you acknowledged? You acknowledged what Louis C.K. said. Context, right? Context is everything. And I think that's where we... Some people can... don't get that, though. All right? I think there's a, a, a substantial... We'll see. I've had, I've done a couple of these videos where people were upset. In fact, the last one I did, some people got really upset with me. We did some more George Floyd talking. Uh, by you the way, with let's Gerald look, Fritz? no, with, with Gerald, we spoke about, uh, it was, this was pre George Floyd and we were talking about COVID-19 and the effect on the chess community. Uh, that was the big gist of the conversation, but I spoke, do you know Jeremiah Hosea? I don't really know. 
He's a musician and he's a, a teacher of both chess and martial arts. A talented guy, interesting fellow. I've done a little radio work with him and we talked, I think it was two days ago, and some people got upset at that conversation. They felt that uh, not enough time and effort and uh, was given to discussion of George Floyd specifically and perhaps not enough outrage that everything was, you know, kind of clinical on my end. I don't know. Anyway, everyone's entitled to their thought and the thing. Well, I guess to put a button on it, context is hard. And that brings me back to what I was saying about the two different worlds we live in. You know, there's the letter of a law and then there's the spirit of the law. There is what someone says and what we think that person means. And to get to context, we have to be able to understand pretext. We have to be able to understand subtext and we have to understand the text itself. And and that is extremely impossible if we are not aware and alert of history and other people's experiences and basically empathy. Empathy is really what can help us have better representatives and better government and you know better almost everything is the the understanding of people's different experiences and the value of differences because what we are doing now is we have this uh uh identification of difference and this uh pre you know determination of differences without uh, saying how will our future be affected by it. So when I talk about the context of what you're saying when, you know, you're in a group of other Jews and you guys are just like, oh, you know, those freaking uh, Shlomo and Jaime, ha, 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 ha. You know, it's, a, it's, it's your in-joke, you know? It's, it's what you guys are talking about. And I wouldn't jump in and be like, ha, 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 ha. I'm like, that's cool. Like, you guys get to do that because it's your group. And, and... You know, there's a lot of people who say like, oh, you know, this guy got a, a pass. They gave him a hall pass so he can say the N-word. And like, he's going to like walk around like, yeah, I got a hall pass. I'm going to go down there freaking Crenshaw and like call everybody this, that, and the other. It's context and it's understanding shared. When intent. it's an insult, if that word comes from a white person, it's an insult. To a degree, it's giving that white person power. They, that they already have in the first place. But even more power, right? So here's a person that has so much power in society already, right? It's privileged, right? And and all the things that go along with being white. But and then on top of that, add to their list of things that they can do to bother others. Right? They can use the N-word and if it upsets a black person, that is power that that person has additional power, right? I feel like it should oh I feel like for me, I want my people i want everyone really to absorb those sorts of insults i don't want them to be relevant anymore right and i think through usage just constant regular usage i want to i would like to have i don't need to use the n-word personally i don't care or any other uh racial slur i don't i really truly don't and i never do just for the purpose of this conversation we're discussing it but the reason i don't use it is the reason that i would like to see them disarmed i don't want to insult people and make them feel bad even no matter what my intention is, which is why I'm feeling bad already that I said those words before, because you're right, I might, I might, I might end up hurting someone's feelings unintentionally. You Phil, uh, that's the thing. You just explained what is in your heart. You did not have the intent to hurt. And this is hard because I can rob a bank and not have the intent to rob the bank and I can still go to jail. You know, there's involuntary manslaughter. There are instances where ignorance is no defense of what you have done. And nevertheless, we still have these situations where, you know, what, regardless of what the epithet is that we use, the goalposts will continue to move. If you go on 4chan, if you go on alt-right Reddit, if you go to, there's these guys called Boogaloo Boys and, and uh, Proud Boys, and right now they're organizing the race war and they're mounting their guns, and they're showing up in these cities, and they're planting pallets of bricks in the waves of protesters. So That's that actually not true. That part I can say for sure, because I researched it. That um, is a meme that has been put out, but is not true. There are no pallets of bricks that were placed for protesters. Check Snopes on that one. But the rest of what you've said, I'm, I'm with. Go ahead. <laughs> so the point is they're changing the, the epithets. Instead of calling them, you know, uh, niggers, they're calling them dunders or dundies, and they just keep changing it. The, and they'll, they'll continue changing it. It doesn't matter what the epithet is. It is what is, as you said, given power to hurt. 
when I come into an online forum and people are talking about Purim or something like that, they're like, oh man, this Purim is going to be great. And someone's like, you know, uh, they say the K word over and over and over again. What the administrator of that would do is he would be like, okay, I'm going to block out that word so that no one in this forum can use it. But then what they're going to do in their forum is they're going to be like, hey, let's use the word, uh, I don't know, freaking camera for them instead so that that's the epithet we use <laughs> we're calling them cameras and all of a sudden that gets disseminated they come in and then they keep moving the goalposts they're like ah oh, you you cameras you you and then they find out that that's what they're using to hurt them and they change it i am it's a camera not, don't think not, i'm not <laughs> <laughs> it's not the word though it is the intent and that intent is ex like how do you change that you cannot change human nature because human nature comes from anger, fear, disgust, also love, but there are these, and sadness, like these, these primal lizard brain feelings that we get, humans have been around for 180,000 years. And, you know, in order to survive, we've had to develop these fears of the unknown and the different. And, you know, we've, again, evolved rapidly. But we haven't evolved past fear. We haven't evolved past fear of the unknown and fear of the other. And there always will be others. And like you show a, a one-year-old child images of like white faces and black faces, they will sometimes just like look at them and be like, uh, I like this one and not that one. And, and there's so much data that goes against, you know, our sayings of being nurtured towards certain feelings in certain ways. And I'm talking about sexism and homophobia and all kinds of things. Now, this is not me giving a uh, carte blanche for hate. This is me saying we need more complex understanding. The, the, the Black Lives Matter started under a Black, uh, you know, president, a Black attorney general, a Black secretary, and you know, Philando Castile, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, all of those things happened under Obama. And we can't really like say that a couple of changes here and there are gonna fix things. We're not gonna fix racism in the next couple of years with a few marches. So your friend who's saying like, oh, you know, we should burn everything down. There was an accelerationist principle started by this alt-right guy named Nick Land. And, you know, the reason that you have this, um, uh, element within the Black Lives Matter protests of people taking these bricks that you say aren't planted, but you also didn't explain where these bricks come from. Well, these uh, bricks I, but I can, I mean, I can just, I'll provide you a link to Snopes.com. Do you, do you count them as a credible source? Sure. But what, where, but just for the purpose of our conversation, where do they say the bricks are coming from? That in some cases they are just, in a couple of cases, there's a, there are construction sites. You're just bricks there. And that in many other cases, that they're just pictures of bricks that are in superimposed. I'll share with you the, I'll tell you what, you go ahead and chat. I'm going to share with you the link right now about seen, the bricks. I've seen videos of piles and pallets of bricks that are being moved around by police officers and on trucks. I've seen these. Okay. I mean, these are not like doctored images. I'm, I'm telling you that these are, are videos. And, and the truth is, I mean, listen, we live in a, a post-truth world. I mean, there are deep fakes and there's all kinds of video manipulation. And a big part of our current dystopia is the uh, attack on our senses so that we don't know what to believe because we can't even believe what we see. So if you go, let's, let's just want the audience to know. If you go to Snopes.com and put into the search field, bricks and protesters you will the second hit will be a discussion of the pallets of bricks which i by the way have posted to your chat you can check that link anytime you'd like if you count snopes.com as a credible uh fact checker then i think we have to accept that there's that that you know some of the bricklaying as it were is fishishish yeah well I, I will check out that Snopes article. I think one thing that I have done in my life to try to increase my wisdom is when I am confronted with information that is counter to what I've believed, I do not dig my heels in deeply. But I'm only telling you what I've seen with my own eyes 
And that is... How many pallets of bricks have you seen with your own eyes? Not through video, with your own eyes. Oh, I've seen, I've seen them in... They were right by the Barclay Center. There was a pallet of bricks in Brooklyn. And, and like, all, most of it I've seen... Like, there was one also in, like, midtown Manhattan by, like, a bank. And, like, these are just... You're selling protests. yourself. You're selling yourself. Was there... Were they near a construction site at Barclays? No, there was no construction going on. In fact, there, I mean, you can check out a lot of these videos as well. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, listen, I'll, I'll click. On I mean, I want to believe you. That's why I'm asking these questions because I, you are a firsthand witness, your primary source. So I yeah, have to believe you over Snopes. But, but I, wanna, I, I need to ask these questions though. But, and there's also uh, a plurality of reports of, of people with now, yes, we can check bots online and all kinds of things, but there are images, but that's not my point. The point is the element within the protests that, you know, all of the people who are aggrieved and right, righteously outraged about George Floyd, who are marching and chanting Black Lives Matter and, you know, extremely multiple of people who are very, very peaceful. That opportunistic element that is coming from, let's say, like uh, the Occupy WTO type protesters, and then the Antifa type protesters. And then finally, if you keep going down the spectrum to the pure anarchist type protesters, a lot of these Venn diagrams overlap. But where the strange overlaps is, the, the, the strange bedfellows are made are where you see both the fascist and the anti-fascist both often wanting a lot of the same thing, which is a war. They want like the, the on, on these alt-right websites where they're pushing for some war. I, I, would, I would like to see that on the, on the left. I don't see that on the Antifa media. I don't see that. I see, I'm just telling you what I have noticed. I have gone and looked up a bunch. There's more than one. So that's another thing is that there's no centralized Antifa nope, uh, there's no. organization. So like you can have as many opinions about what should happen politically as there are members of, or people that self-identify essentially as right. Antifa. But there is, so there are websites out there and there's information out there. I have not seen as part of uh, the Antifa dogma, a desire for war. What I see is that, or violence, other than as a confrontation, as a reaction to fascism. Just what I've seen. Maybe there are people that yes. feel otherwise. Certainly. There is a lot of um, de-escalation going on by a lot of people who are anti-fascist. But bringing the fight to fascists is a, a central tenet to, to anti-fascism. Is yes. There are people who are armed to the teeth. And they are, I believe, especially on the left, the the least milk toast, and the they they are the quickest to anger, which is the the people who see the the evolution and the destruction of America, and they're trying to stop it because it's happening by, you know, anti-black, anti-Jewish, and strong fascist elements in this country. But regardless of what they're they're doing, this acceleration, this throwing gasoline on the fire that is burning this country there are many people who see that as possibly the only way through the forest is you know the the immense poverty that we suffer in this country and the immense mismanagement and corruption in this country and a lot of the things the the structures that we hold dear they the reason that they are for the violent destruction of it is because they need to send some sort of a greater message to the people who are in power. I mean, Detroit and Chicago John, burned for you. several days in 1968, and let I think me, people won't rest until down. they see more burning. Let me, we're getting towards the end of the time for the interview, so let me just steer you. I want to end on a note that is hopeful and positive, if that's possible, so. Trust me, I am like Ken Deed. I, I, I am extremely optimistic. Uh, one thing in my Zen and Taoist sort of pursuits is to say the world is not the worst of all possible worlds. We are always living in the best of all possible worlds. And if, if we start thinking that way more often, then we will 
be able to start affecting the changes that we see if we start believing not only in ourselves to change, but believing in ourselves to change ourselves for the better. My optimism comes from one good question. And this question was, uh, it was basically asked after, it was, it was last year and I, I, it stayed in my mind ever since. Would you rather be at peace with yourself and at war with the world? Or would you rather be at war with yourself and at peace with the world. That's and a perfect, that's a pro, can we not answer that question? I would like people to try and answer that in the comments down below. Yeah, look down there. Oops, there it is, down there in the comments and answer that question if you would be so kind. John, I wanna thank you so much for joining me this evening. It has been a pleasure. We've exceeded actually the 25 minute limit for the interview by quite a bit. So hey man, I'm a yapper dog. No, that's okay. I mean, that's why you're here. I know that you're going to provide some thoughtful insights and that's why you're here. So I don't mind running, I don't mind going over when it's appropriate. I uh, want to thank again. Let me thank you again for sharing your thoughts and uh, hopefully as things progress, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about this again, maybe sort of on the other side of protest, not maybe, I don't know if on the other side of racism would be nice. I think that's uh, perhaps a bridge too far. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I love you, man. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Take care, John. Yeah.